Andrew Holmes, thank you very much indeed for coming back onto Evolution Soup. You're a paleoanthropologist and a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Department of Anthropology, and your main interest is in the evolutionary history of ancient primates from millions of years ago. So how were things for you during this almost worldwide lockdown? Have you been able to uh, work on any new research? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm just staying at home, writing, uh, baking <laughs> some delicious cakes and bread oh, yeah. and stuff like that. So, no, I mean, um, yeah, I've been doing, I've been working on research, doing, doing a lot of writing. Um, I have a, uh, some research that I'm going to be presenting at the American Association of Physical Anthropology or annual conference here. But, uh, as you can imagine this year, it's an online conference. So, um, yeah. So yeah, I'll be showing some stuff there. Some stuff I did on uh, the Pliopus, um, which I've talked about with you before. The the mm -hmm. main primates that I uh, study, they're kind of like monkey-like uh, primates that lived in Europe and Asia. So we just uh, took a look at um, some characteristics of their teeth, and we were able to determine some some kind of interesting things about them there. But that'll all be, uh, as I said, it'll be coming up at the. Um, AAPA, as we call it, the American Association of Physical Anthropology. And I'll have uh, that research up on my research gate online for people to check out too later on if they like. Fantastic. On our last interview, we talked about Gigantopithecus, the largest primate that ever lived. And before that, we discussed ancient monkeys and apes. Today, we're going to be returning to ancient monkeys in the light of a new and unexpected fossil find in Peru, a fossil that links the monkeys of Africa, where they evolved, to the monkeys of Central and South America. And we ask that all important question, how the hell did they get there? Uh, but before we jump into this, Andrew, could you just give us an overview of what we know about the monkeys of Africa, the old world monkeys, as well as those of Central and South America, the new world monkeys? Okay. Yeah, when we're talking about monkeys, we're talking about a type of primate called an anthropoid. So an anthropoid would include all the monkeys and would even include uh, apes and humans as well. Um, and the way you can think about it is there's basically kind of like two types of anthropoids today in the world. We have uh, what are called caterons and platerons. Uh, the caterons includes old world monkeys, apes, humans, and, and this group is originally endemic to Africa and Asia. And then we have the, uh, the platerons, which are only found in the New World, and they're found in South and Central America and, and the southernmost part of, of North America. Um, so the rhine in their name, like Caterine and, and Platerine, is, is actually a reference to their nose. Because strangely enough, all the major primate groups are named mm. in reference to their nose. Uh, so Caterine basically means downward-facing nostrils. Like humans, you know, we have nostrils that uh -huh. face downwards, as, as do the apes. And uh, a Platerine means uh, kind of a flat or sideways-facing nostril. So their nostrils are more off to the side. So, uh, and these are some of the traits. There's a number of different traits that can be used to tell these primates apart, but um, that's a soft tissue trait. So it's not even the most useful for us uh, paleontologically, but luckily there's there's a way, there's a lot more different clues in the anatomy that we can use to mm -hmm. tell platerines and caterines apart. They have different numbers of teeth. Uh, there's a lot of different differences in their post crania. Some of the some of the new world monkeys are the type of monkeys that can grab stuff with their tails, right? Mm. Whereas like old world monkeys, we can't you know can't do that. These these are modern groups. And if you go back far enough in time, um, still the platyrrhines and caterines would have shared an ancestor somewhere around 40 million years ago or so. Um, as as I said, like the, you, we just only see the platyrrhines. They they appear in the in the fossil record. Uh, in South America, uh, starting around 37, 35 million years ago, you see this thing called Peru Pithecus, and there's Brenicella boliviana, uh, there's Humunculus patagonicus. There's a number of, uh, hmm. of species that we know from uh, South America. Yeah. Let's look at this new information that was released only last month, April 2020, about a monkey fossil found in Peru, South America. Now, there are dozens of monkey species in that part of the world, so what could be so special about just another fossil? 
All right, yeah, so this new species, I believe it's called, and, you know, forgive my pronunciation here, Eucalipithecus uh, perdita. Um, now, unlike the fossil species that I just mentioned that were fossil platyrons or fossil New World monkeys, uh, this primate doesn't appear to be a platyron or a cateron. Uh, it's actually something... It's a little bit more primitive, a little bit earlier. It belongs to a group of, group of primates we call the parapithecids. Um, yeah, and so, so it's, it's really unique. No one expected to find a parapithecid in, in the New World. So apart from this find in Peru, what do we know of parapithecids? We must have some fossils from somewhere. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of parapithecids in the fossil records. The difference is most parapithecids come from Egypt. They come from the Eocene and the and the Oligocene of, of Egypt. There's a number of different species. There's Parapithecus, there's Simonius, there's Quatrania, and there's this one species called Epidium phylomensi, which we actually know quite a bit about. We have like lots of teeth, there's there's cranial fossils, post-cranial fossils, so they give us an idea of how this uh, this animal uh, you know these animals moved around, how they would have lived and stuff like this. So the so the really weird thing is is we have these parapithecids in Egypt and then all of a sudden Boom, there's a parapithecid in South America, which no one really predicted. Um, yeah. You know, and, uh, and so phylogenically, what the, what the parapithecids kind of represent is they'd be a really primitive branch on the anthropoid family tree. And as I said before, uh, we're anthropoids, uh, and all monkeys, and whether they're New World monkeys or Old World monkeys, they're all anthropoids as well. So the parapithecids are this really early branch. Of, of, our, of our family. So we all would have shared a common ancestor, but um, like many, many primate group, groups from the, from the past, there's no living uh, parapithecids today. We know that that group seemingly went extinct. Okay, so these parapithecids have no direct relation to New World monkeys, yet somehow made the journey from Africa to South America many millions of years earlier. And this could have been done before or after the New World monkeys got there. But the point is that this amazing transatlantic crossing happened at least twice. Now, the big question is, how on earth did they do it? Yeah, so it's a pretty amazing journey when you think about it, getting from all the way from Africa, across the Atlantic Ocean, down to South America. Um, and we see that the Platyrines probably did this sometime in the, in the late Eocene. 40 and 35 million years ago, probably in that window. Um, so, you know, there's been lots of different ideas proposed over the years of, of how they did this, but I think the one that holds the, uh, the most amount of weight is, um, is they probably floated over on some sort of piece of vegetation. Um, now, there's a number of different ideas about what that vegetation could be, and it's, it's very unlikely we're actually going to find any false evidence that will definitively tell us how they floated over because, you know, yeah. it's a tree or something, it's probably long gone. And to find the exact tree would be even more unlikely. But we can uh, we can propose some different ideas. And one idea I like, um, it, it's not just uh, like a monkey clinging to like a, a stick or something like that and sailing across the ocean. But there's these things called uh, floating tree, floating islands, right? Mm. Um, these are weird phenomena, but they do appear. And we actually have documented historical cases. I believe there's one uh, seen in the early 20th century in, um, in the St. Lawrence River here in Canada. And so what they are is they're just pieces of land that kind of break off and maybe they'll have like a tree or two of them and like a little bit, a little bit of a landmass and they can float around and they travel, you know, in, in oceans and, and down streams and stuff like this. So maybe there was something kind of like that, like a little bit of a tiny little mini Island with a, with one primate, maybe even just a one pregnant female primate that, that made the trip. Now, when you want to say like how likely is it for them to make the trip and how quick could they do it there's actually some some really good science on this um in particular is this paper by a guy named huel i uh, put it back in the in the late 90s and, and what he wanted to say okay let's say we have a floating island let's take a look at the factors that we'd have to measure to see how quickly they could make the how, how quickly you can make a crossing from africa to South America. So if we go back to the time when this was probably happening with the ancestors of the New World monkeys, there's a couple uh, more favorable factors. Once those two continents are a little bit closer together back then. Uh -huh. And uh, there's also some new evidence suggesting that there might have been some lower water 
uh, the sea levels were a little bit lower at that point as well, thus making the, the journey a little bit uh, shorter. But in Hugh's estimation, when you, when, you, when you have both favorable wind currents that would maybe blow like the tree that could work like a sail on the island, and then you have favorable ocean currents as well, you can make the trip hmm. in, in about a week. It takes about a week. Um, so that's the idea that I like the best because uh, I think it kind of makes sense. Now, there's, there's other people who, who don't like oceanic voyages and so they proposed other things um like that there was some sort of land bridge between africa and south america the problem with that there's absolutely no geological evidence of there ever being a land bridge at this time um then that's led others to suggest well maybe not a land bridge maybe a, a series of islands maybe there's islands there again there's, there's no evidence of these islands between mm. uh, America, you know, South America and Africa. And if you think about it, if you invoke multiple islands and this idea of island hopping, it's actually you're just invoking more transatlantic voyages, so it becomes less parsimonious. And so instead of saying, oh, they did it in one trip, maybe it took about a week, you're saying, oh, now we know they did a bunch of successive trips. So anyway, you slice it, even though it can seem unlikely, like how did they make that trip all the way across the ocean? Uh, it, once you play out unlikely events over a long enough time span, a few of them, you know, they're going to work out. And this seems to be uh, the case in, in this situation that the, the, somehow the an ancestors of the Platyrons sailed across the ocean about, you know, uh, 35, 31 million years ago, somewhere in there. And we are talking about a long period of time. And of course, like you say, it's an unlikely event, but we're talking about a long period of time. Yeah. Andrew, has this kind of ocean crossing happened before with other species? Yeah, so uh, now as we can see, we know the Platyrons made that crossing. Uh, we know the Parapithecids made that crossing, but we also see a group of um, African rodents that make the trip around the same time. They're called the Caviomorphs. And so today the Caviomorph rodents would be like guinea pigs, capybaras, but they're a part of an African group uh, that seems to have probably floated over around the uh, same time. Um, now, more recently, we can see that animals are still still been making the trip as the you know continents got further and further apart and the sea levels raised. Uh, that there's I think something like seven or eight different species of skink. Skink's like a, a legless lizard. Uh, but about nine million years ago, we see that there's some skinks that come over from Africa to South America. Um, and it's even suggested that there's there's a bird called a hotsin, which is a, a weak flying bird. They're, they're not particularly good at flying. They're from South America, but they think they might have even rafted over from uh, from Africa at some point. Because uh, they have claws, don't they? It could just <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know that a lot about them. They're, they're kind of cool looking, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I can't, I'm I'm no bird expert over, over here. And we we see we see crossings all over the world too. It's not just this one between um, South America and Africa. We see it uh, we see it between a Africa and Madagascar. That's how like the ancestors of the lemurs got over there. They, that uh, Madagascar has been separate from Africa for over 120 million years, but the Af but the lemurs only showed up there about 50 60 million years ago, which meant they would have had to cross over. And we see. Um, we see American uh, geckos in, in North America. They seem to be descended from African, uh, you know, animals that, that would have traveled over. And, and then, you know, you see it also, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, with semi-aquatic animals like turtle, turtles and hippos and stuff like this. Uh, the hippos, again, just like the lemurs, came from Africa over to Madagascar. And it's, you know, it's a little bit even more plausible because it's like, oh, they'll be fine in the water. They don't need to grab on into anything. They're just hippos, right? So, there you go. Right, and can we see any evidence of such crossings today? Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, you know, there's always weird stuff with animals showing up in places that they shouldn't be. And I think one of the more interesting examples I can think of comes from the, the late 90s um, in, in, in the Caribbean. So uh, around 1995, there was a series of hurricanes down there. And uh, this this one is interesting because you actually have people see the actual event take place. There's this um, uprooted tree which ends up on the island of Anguilla in, in the Caribbean, and this tree is carrying about mm, something like 15 different iguanas, and it lands on this island. There's no iguanas on this island. Um, they did they were able later to determine these these iguanas probably came from Guadalupe, 
Um, and scientists who studied the weather patterns uh, seem to suggest that these iguanas were probably out at sea floating around on this island for about three weeks. And then they land on this, they land on this island in 1995 and they did fine. They're still there today. They, uh, within about a year or two, they started breeding and now there's like a little population of iguanas who just floated there in the, in the mid nineties. So, you know, it's a really well-documented example of it, of the green, of the green iguana. Now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when an animal species finds themselves in a totally new environment, a new country or continent, it must affect how it evolves, right? Yeah, yeah, and so I think we see that with the, with the New World monkeys, right? So you see, uh, um, it's kind of like there was almost a world waiting for them to exploit uh, this brave new world just sitting there. Um, mm -hmm. and to, so, so today we see that uh, in the, amongst the platyrons, there's all these different types, and they, they fit into about five families, right? Um, but we, what we also see in the, in the early fossil record of those platyrons is those five families seem to emerge relatively quickly. So what we call this is an adaptive radiation. It's a process in which uh, organisms, they diversify into all these different forms, uh, particularly when there's like um, this new environment available to them, these new challenges, these new niches that they fit into. So whatever the ancestor of this platyrine that floated over, uh, very quickly seemed to like diversify into all these different trees. You have like all these different trees. And this is another interesting thing is where you have like catarons like the, the guys who stayed back in the old world the monkeys they're they're actually more diverse in tight in terms of some aspects of their locomotion like there are terrestrial monkeys right the ones that'll stay or primarily live on the ground you don't see any of that in in south america they're all arboreal they all live in trees but they all live in different parts of the tree some of them live in the very top some of them live in the middle some of them live you know closer to to the bottom of the canopy and uh hmm. And so you can you see sometimes you see like a monkey and it's like you just think a monkey's in a tree, and it's like no within that tree there can be tons of different ecological niches and so that seems to have affected mm. this this adaptive radiation as these animals exploded and spread out across South America, because some of the earliest fossils that we have for these South American primates aren't found in brazil or along the coast or anything like that they're actually found deep inside like in bolivia and in peru and stuff like that so we know that they not only made that trip but then they just you know took off across the new world so it seemed like it was a really good you know a really rare event but something that was really beneficial and led to the yeah. diversification of this whole uh you know all these number of species that we still have today right right well Here's an intriguing thought. If the parapithecids are more related to old world monkeys, that is, African monkeys, as we've said, do they then have any possible connection to humans? So perhaps a better way to think about it is, is parapithecids are like the sister taxa to both old world and new world monkeys, which means that technically they're kind of cousins to both groups. They're both, you know, that they would have branched off first and then the divergence between the old world monkeys and the new world monkeys happened. So we're all cousins, but we can even say with the parapithecids, all the monkeys, the ants, we all share a common ancestor. And this common ancestor is very close to the base of the anthropoid family tree. And so, you know, we all share that in common. I just think it's really cool that one of our earliest anthropoid cousins was either uh, brave enough or, or stupid enough or just made some weird accidental mistake and end up sailing across the Atlantic Ocean. And they survived, you know, the parapithecid, this new fossil that we find, we find that that lineage didn't make it, that that one died out in, 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 the, in the new world. But on the other hand, the platyrons did great. Right. Well, it's a really amazing thought to think of these animals colonizing new lands almost in the way that we humans do. No doubt more new data will come to light that will add some more fascinating details to the story of primates. As always, I'll put links to your social media and our previous interviews in the description below. And once again, I just want to thank you, Andrew, for coming back to Evolution Soup. Well, thanks for having me.